All right, so thank you very much. Uh, I've, thank you very much for the invitation to this workshop. I'm uh, having a very great time so far, except for my bag not coming, but that, that, that'll that be solved in the very near future. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very excited um, for this workshop. So what I'm gonna do here is talk about um, some recent work of mine on propagation mechanisms of monsoon intraseasonal oscillations. There we go. Okay, so just to sort of set the stage here for what I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna be talking about the boreal summer version of um, the intraseasonal oscillation, which some people call the monsoon intraseasonal oscillation, some people call the boreal summer intraseasonal oscillation, there's other names for it. Um, I'm mainly gonna call it the BSISO here, although it means you know, many different things. Um, so this is a plot from Sperber and Anamale 2008, where they generate a composite life cycle of the BSISO. And so you could see here that, whoops, it, um, starts in the Indian Ocean near the equator, and then during summertime moves northward and both eastward um, as time progresses. And this entire life cycle here is a composite life cycle that's about 40 or 50 days long, something, something of that order. Um, this looks like the boreal winter version of this phenomenon, typically called the Madden-Julian oscillation in its eastward propagation, although that um, particular phenomenon doesn't move um, in latitude as much as the boreal summer version does. So what I'm interested in this plot is trying to understand this northward propagation across both the Indian Ocean and in the Western Pacific Ocean as well. There's a very nice um, example of that there. Okay, so there have been um, a whole slew of northward propagation mechanisms that have been um, described and proposed in the literature. I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, one notable thing is that a lot of the work on northward propagation has actually been done here in Bangalore. I can't really list all of the work and, and studies that have concentrated um, on northward propagation in, in the monsoon, uh, intraseasonal oscillation here, but um, I was actually um, sort of nervous about giving this talk, given all of the strong work that's been done here on that topic. Um, here, I'm gonna talk about mainly two things. I'm gonna talk about um, two propagation mechanisms that involve horizontal advection of moisture. And that's um, in relation to this paper that I've been involved with, with uh, Jinan Zhang in 2018. And I'm also gonna talk about another paper on northward propagation that involves sea surface temperature feedbacks. And that's a paper that I've been involved with um, by Lee et al. in 2018 as well. Although I should mention that there's a whole bunch of other hypotheses here for northward propagation that I'm not going to address. Okay, so here are those two papers just for, um, just to reiterate. So the framework that I'm gonna look at this in is um, using something called the vertically integrated moist static energy budget. And this is the equation that's um, relevant to this framework. So what I have on here is a quantity H, which is um, the sum of sensible um, potential and latent heat. And um, this is a tendency equation showing the local tendency here, horizontal advection, vertical advection. And then on the right-hand side of this, we have radiation, latent heat flux, and sensible heat flux. The brackets here represent a column integral from the surface to the top of the troposphere. Um, so many people have been using this equation for a variety of different reasons, um, not only to study the MJ and BSISO, but also to study convective aggregation in the tropics, to study tropical cyclones, to study the tropical mean state, um, a lot of different um, applications of this particular equation. Um, so we're gonna use this. And one notable thing about this equation is that once you get into the deep tropics, this equation essentially becomes a moisture budget in that temperature gradients in the atmosphere, at least above the boundary layer are very weak. And so that, provides constraints on the thermodynamic energy budget in terms of temperature tendency um, and um, you know, temper horizontal temperature advection being negligible, things like that. So this equation essentially becomes a moisture tendency equation if we're thinking about the deep tropics. And so um, you could think about this in terms of a moistening if you want. 
So we've applied this equation to the MJO, and this is actually um, something I did with Kieran, who's in the room, one of my um, former postdocs at uh, Colorado State, who's now a faculty member here in India. And we actually applied this equation to the Julian oscillation, which is the boreal winter version of this phenomenon we're looking at. And so these two plots here, I'm not going to go into too much detail, basically show um, moist static energy budget tendencies in the Western Pacific. The um, total tendency is this bluish line here. And what we showed in this paper is that the tendency of moist static energy or moisture in this region is driven both by horizontal moisture advection and vertical moisture advection. Um, so that's one, one thing that you know, came out of this particular study. Um, but I want to apply this not to the wintertime version of the MJO, but the boreal summer version of this phenomenon. And so this is something that we did in this paper by Jean Gadel 2018. And let's concentrate here on these right two panels. Um, this is a composite analysis of a boreal summer intraseasonal event. Um, this is rainfall at lag zero of its life cycle. And India is here, Bay of Bengal is here. And you can see an area of enhanced precipitation sitting over this region. And then there's an area of suppressed precipitation to the north. Um, with time, this whole thing moves off towards the the north, and that's going to be the thing we're trying to explain here. Um, of interest is that the column moist static energy, ME, is shown on this bottom plot, and um, the moisture field or the moist static energy field, depending on how you want to look at it, is actually in phase with rainfall, so that's very important for the diagnosis that comes next. So what determines the northward propagation is basically going to be the thing that moves this moist static energy distribution towards the north. Um, just to make a point, um, the analysis that we've done here has also been looked at by some other people, including some in the room. So I don't want to make the point here that this is uh, um, completely um, new, um, but um, we look at it in a slightly different way than other, other studies. Okay, so let's apply this equation to the boreal summer ISO now. Um, so these six panels are um, the six panels that describe this budget here. Um, this first, actually, this upper right panel here is actually the rainfall distribution. So it peaks here just to the south of India at this time. Um, this term here is the tendency equation. So what you could see here is that there is a positive moist static energy tendency to the north of precipitation and a negative tendency to the south. So this is consistent with what we would expect if we had um, a northward moving um, phenomena that is regulated by the moist static energy or moisture field. Um, so that's consistent. And then these other um, four panels here are horizontal advection of moist static energy in this plot. This is vertical moist static energy advection. This is the radiative heating term. And this is the sum of surface fluxes right here. Um, of interest is that if you look at the surface flux anomaly field, you see that surface flux anomalies are positive to the south and negative to the north. So surface fluxes actually help to slow down the northward propagation of the BSISO. And so that's um, a very important point. I'm not going to talk too much more about that, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, radiation is in phase with the rainfall anomaly. And so this is why people have cited radiative feedbacks as being an important maintenance mechanism for things like the BSISO and MJO. Um, so that's, you know, can be shown by this plot. Um, but as far as propagation, the two terms I'm gonna concentrate on here are these two. Um, so this term is horizontal advection. So um, by far in this analysis, what you could see is that horizontal advection is um, in phase with the tendency and also the dominant term in helping to move the boreal summer ISO northward. So that's an important point based on this plot. Um, but there's another term here that I'll also talk about, and this term is vertical advection. And it's also in phase with the moisture tendency and um, you know, slightly weaker than horizontal advection, but also um, appreciable. So, so this term I'll also analyze in terms of sea surface temperature feedbacks as uh, potentially being, being important for northward propagation later. Okay, so horizontal advection and um, vertical advection. 
Okay, so there's a lot on this plot, but let me um, just want to quickly make the point, what is causing this horizontal direction to move the ISO northward? Um, so we did a decomposition of the horizontal advection to various different various terms, and by far in this analysis, what we found was the most important for, term for north, uh, northward propagation was the anomalous ISO flow acting on the mean humidity field. So if you have a flow anomaly associated with the ISO, it is um, you know, moving northward across a mean moisture gradient, and that's what's responsible for moving um, the ISO northwards. And um, this plot here um, shows sort of a pictorial of that in action. Um, this is where the center of convection is sitting right here at this dot. So rainfall is positive throughout this region. Um, there's a positive tendency to the north. And what's plotted on here are anomalous wind vectors at 850 millibars. Um, Actually, it's a column integral from 600 to 900, but you could think about these as being about 850 millibars. And at this stage of the MJO, when you have rainfall here, there's actually easterly flow to the north. And this easterly flow is actually acting across a mean moisture distribution, which is shown in colors, which generally is stronger to the east and less to the west. And so you're getting positive moisture advection across this across this uh, gradient in this region. It's a little bit subtler than I'd expect. Um, and there's a lot of bumps and wiggles in here, but, but by far, you know, this term is actually what is dominant in, in terms of northward propagation. Okay, so I'll follow up on that point a little bit here and talk about climate models. So if a climate model can't get that gradient right and that moisture distribution right, you could argue that it can't get the northward propagation right. So this is a um, spectrum of climate models um, that we analyzed from CMIP5. And on each of these plots, um, you have a time lag on this axis and then a latitude on this axis. So if the disturbance is going up and to the right, it's basically propagating northward in this sort of plot, uh, plot space here. Um, and then, so this is observations, and then all of these other things are climate models. And you can see that um, some climate models completely fail to get northward propagation across the Indian Ocean, like this one here. Um, but others do a reasonably good job. Um, so for example, this model here, the CNRM, does a pretty good job of getting northward propagation, but then there's a whole spectrum um, in between. Um, so what we did here is we analyzed the ability of models to get northward propagation against the ability of models to um, represent the mean humidity field in this region. And so on this axis is a measure of northward propagation skill, which is basically a pattern correlation of that observed a northward propagation plot versus the model northward propagation plot. Um, and then this is the skill of the low level mean moisture pattern here. Um, and that's also done by a pattern correlation. And what you could see here is that there's pretty good relationship between models that get the right mean moisture field in the Indian Ocean and also models that get northward propagation right. So it seems like getting the mean state moisture is, is a very important aspect of getting you know, proper northward propagation. Deepak, how much time do I have left? 15 minutes, okay, good. Okay, so, so We've argued here that horizontal advection is a very important propagation mechanism. Um, but how about that vertical advection term I showed you before? Um, and this is a term that we argue might be related to sea surface temperature feedbacks. Um, and um, sea surface temperature feedbacks um, you know, is trying to draw the monsoon intraseasonal oscillation northward. So let's look at that a little bit. Um, so it's been well documented that there are um, significant sea surface temperature module, you know, variations associated with the boreal summer version of the ISO. Um, this is a particular study from 2004 from the Bombex, uh, Bombex, Obmex, sorry, field experiment. Um, and sea surface temperature from the, um, you know, buoy at this location is shown here. And so you can see that there's, um, you know, reasonable sea surface temperature variations, amplitude something like half a degrees um, during um, this particular time period associated with um, intraseasonal variability. And you could also see intraseasonal variability in wind stress and also in OLR on this particular plot. 
Um, so we looked at the importance of these sea surface temperature variations um, for northward propagation in this particular study by Zhang et al. 2018. And what's shown on here is um, are several, you know, a few different composite fields. Um, this is precipitation anomalies. Uh, this is sea surface temperature anomalies, and this is the sea surface temperature tendency, this middle column. And then these are three different times um, in the life cycle of an intra-seasonal oscillation. So you should be able to see um, precipitation propagating northward as you go through these panels. Um, and if you look at the sea surface temperature anomaly field, um, what you see here are sea surface temperature anomalies of um, 0.2 degrees Celsius or greater that tend to align themselves north of this precipitation anomaly region. Um, so they're approximately in quadrature with the precipitation anomaly. Um, and so we showed this in this study, although previous studies have also um, shown this, this um, sort of behavior as well. So one thing that we're interested in in particular here is the ability of the sea surface temperature anomalies to drive um, surface convergence um, due to um, anomalous sea surface temperature gradients in this region. So the idea here is that in regions of um, warm sea surface temperatures, um, if you use hydrostatic balance and integrate downward from the top of the boundary layer, you're going to end up with lower um, pressures at the surface than you do over higher SSTs. And this um, pressure distribution across warm and um, uh, colder SSTs can drive winds that produce convergence. And so we're going to test this possibility using a boundary layer model. And this is a bulk atmospheric boundary layer model that was originally developed by Bjorn Stevens and others, but has more recently been refined by Back and Brotherton in 2009. Um, so basically what we have here is a steady state model with Coriolis force, pressure gradient force. Um, we have entrainment from the top of the boundary layer. And then we also have a surface drag. And H here is the um, depth of the atmospheric boundary layer. So we looked at three different versions of this equation. Um, one is the full model to see if we could represent the reanalysis surface um, uh, pressure and convergence distribution. Um, another model here is if we um, only allow surface pressure to be imposed from the top of the boundary layer from the free troposphere. So that removes the effect of, um, S of, of pressure gradients that are generated within the boundary layer itself. Um, and then a third version of this model is that we use um, surface pressure that's imposed by the sea surface temperature field um, in order to drive the flow in, in the boundary layer. So, so three different um, versions of this model. Um, so we want to look at whether or not the sea surface temperature driven um, part of the pressure field is an important uh, mechanism for driving surface convergence. So this is the result. Um, so this is the reanalysis divergence anomaly field here. So this is sort of our truth, as you would call it, to the extent the reanalysis can provide a truth. Um, this is the models, uh, full models rep representation of this. And so it does a pretty good job of getting the um, in this case, blue is the convergence field occurring to the north uh, of the precipitation um, anomalies pretty well, so that's not bad. Um, this version here is if you only let free troposphere um, processes regulate pressure in the boundary layer, um, and you see that it does a pretty good job of getting some of the features right, but it's clearly not all. And then we have this last term here where we have the sea surface temperatures and sea surface temperatures gradients able to impose boundary layer convergence anomalies. Uh, and what you can see here is from this model, it's actually a combination of both things opposed from above the boundary layer and also sea surface temperature driven convergence that is contributing to northward propagation of the ISO. So um, we were excited to see this. And so it's, it seems feasible, at least, that um, sea surface temperature um, driven convergence anomalies are an important term in helping to move the BSISO northward. And so that's something that came out of this analysis. Probably running out of time a bit. 10 minutes. OK, good. Uh-oh, what happened? All right. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this, but um, based on the promise that these results of SSD-driven convergence showed, we actually developed a local air-sea coupling model um, to um, um, 
generate uh, monsoon local monsoon intraseasonal oscillations. And so what this model consists of is a sea surface temperature tendency equation, which is uh, proportional to um, shortwave radiation and lane heat flux anomalies, and then a precipitation tendency equation, which is proportional to the SST anomaly. And this equation here, um, we sort of embedded with, within it the idea that warm SST anomalies would drive um, surface convergence that would moisten the atmosphere leading to increased precipitation. So this equation here sort of holds the um, physics behind that um, surface convergence analysis that I just showed you. Um, so this is a simple oscillator, and so if you solve this equation, what you could basically see is that you can get um, a, an oscillation of a certain period, and a period is determined by things like the depth of the ocean mix layer, which determines the you know SST tendency. Um, it's also determined by um, you know how strongly related the precipitation tendency is to temperature and things like that. Um, so you can do a lot of cool things with this very local model, um, and so. If, one thing that we did show is that um, this model tends to ring very strongly at 33 days for a 25 meter mixed layer depth, and maybe not coincidentally, this is also the climatological mixed layer depth around the time of monsoon onset. So um, there's a lot of interesting things that you can explore with this model. I don't want to go into it in too much detail given how localized this is, but um, um, it's based on the promising results related to surface convergence. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to show here um, is just briefly talk about um, other ways we've been trying to address northward propagation in the ISO. And we have a Western Pacific um, um, field uh, program called PISTON, which stands for Propagation of Intraseasonal Tropical Oscillations. And one of the goals of PISTON is to understand the northward propagation of the ISO um, in the Western Pacific region. So we had our first component of this in 2018, and the original intent of this was to go sit off the west coast of the Philippines, but we didn't get a research permit. So we ended up, um, as I'll show in the next few slides, um, sitting to the north of Palau at about 135 degrees east. Um, so the 2018 version of Piston um, used the RV Thompson with two cruises. You know, the first one was probably three weeks. The second one was about 30 days. And um, we took observations again to the west of Luzon in the, in the uh, Philippine Sea. Um, we have a suite of both atmosphere and ocean instruments that we used um, during piston. We had a sea pole radar, for example, and um, high resolution soundings out there um, from um, Colorado State. Um, Simon contributed um, some um, you know, expertise on surface fluxes, but we also had a whole suite of ocean measurements, including um, a few different ways of getting turbulence. Um, we had, um, you know, floats, we deployed moorings, so um, a lot of, uh, you know, complementary uh, measurements from the atmosphere and ocean standpoint that we can use to understand the air-sea coupling of, of the BSISO. Um, here's Jim Moom's little piston going up, uh, going on in the upper left here. This is a slide that was generated by Sally Warner at OSU and basically shows the observational coverage that we saw during the piston field program. Um, these are all the typhoons that pass near and to our north uh, during the um, experiment. So maybe this wasn't as good of a BSI, uh, BSISO experiment as it was a typhoon experiment, but anyways, we got a lot of interesting data. Um, here are the different instruments, the you know, time period that they collected. Um, middle here was a port call, that's why there's a gap there. Um, interestingly, we didn't really see a classic BSISO, but there was a lot of variability, so you can see the wind stress field here. And we get these um, a, a few different read, uh, periods that we had things called monsoon tails, where we had really, really strong um, wind stresses and convection just to the south of a typhoon that went north of us. Um, and uh, these are something that um, are going to be an area of emphasis going forward when we're looking at the data set. Uh, let me skip this. Um, so as I mentioned, we had a lot of typhoon um, activity. And um, one of the interesting things that we saw was um, strong variations in the current strength and structure pre and post typhoon. And so this is an analysis that I think Emily was uh, part of. Um, I got this slide 
from two different people, so I don't know who actually made this, but um, showing pre and post typhoon structure in the upper ocean um, before and after um, Typhoon Kong Ray. And you can see here in this panel, the ocean is relatively calm. I think this is zonal and meridional currents. I can't really see. Um, um, but you can see that before the typhoon, um, there is a pretty weak current activity. But if you um, look post typhoon, you see that the ocean has much stronger currents and a um, also a um, you know deeper mixed layer um, and so surface salinity has also um, been increased due to mixing. So there's a lot of interesting things that we're going to get from this data set, um, looking pre and post typhoon. Um, probably have about five minutes left. Um, we didn't see classic monsoon interseasonal oscillations, but we saw a lot of events that looked like this. Um, so this is a typhoon uh, called Jebby that went to our north in September, uh, early September of the field program. Um, our ship was down here, and we saw this very strong what um, people on the cruise started to call monsoon tails associated with these strong westerly winds that extended all the way from the Indian Ocean into the Western Pacific. And these were sustained over a period of several days and created uh, 10 meter per second uh, you know, winds, um, enhanced convection, um, you know, strong fluxes out of the ocean, a lot of very interesting things. And so this sort of event, um, um, you know, got people very interested in, um, in, in understanding this and interactions between the typhoons um, and interseasonal variability. Okay, so maybe this will be my last slide. Um, I noted that in 2018, we ended up in the Western Pacific, but this coming summer, it's likely that we are going to have a period where we're going to be by our original intended location just to the west of Luzon. So we have a, another plan here to take the RV Sally ride with comparable ocean and atmospheric measurements to Piston 2018, um, for a few differences, um, and go off to the west coast of Luzon from September 2nd through about September 22nd with some um, you know, movement um, within there. And one of the ideas here is to study interactions between the northward propagating ISO and the diurnal cycle of convection um, over the you know, coastal um, region and also near coastal waters of Luzon. Um, we don't really know yet whether the diurnal cycle of convection is a help or hindrance to northward propagation, but hopefully after um, this field program, we'll get some ideas into that. And I think I'll skip these two slides. So just to conclude here, um, I showed that horizontal advection is a likely northward, uh, likely important northward propagation mechanism for the BSISO, and this creates a bit of a unified propagation mechanism with the MJO, which I also briefly talked about. Uh, we showed SST-driven convergence may contribute to northward propagation, um, so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this, um, but it, it looks like some initial analysis is pretty promising. Um, I also talked a little bit about the piston field program in 2018, and although we didn't see um, sort of traditional BSISO variability during that year, um, we'll have another chance in 2019 um, to explore interactions between the BSISO and things like the diurnal cycle and the ocean. Um, although 2018 did show a lot of interesting variability. Um, with that, I think I'll wrap up and say thank you. So we, we have time for a short question or two. So Eric? Uh, this program is focused on the hypothesis that ocean SST is important for mesos. You seem skeptical of that. No, no, no. I don't think so. Um, you mean based on that one um, slide that I showed, the oh, moist static energy well, project? Well, if you look at your last slide, it basically expresses skepticism. But maybe you need to roll that back. Let me... Uh... <laughs> This one here, yeah. Oh, with, with this, uh, so so sort of comparing the first statement to the so second. That, that, statement. Yeah, that one's important. Maybe the second one isn't. <laughs> well, so I, that statement is basically based on, and, and again, this is a big caveat. That reanalysis budget that I showed before, comparing the strength of horizontal advection to vertical advection, and so the SST induced convergence would show up as a vertical advection moistening. At the top of the so are there any other SST induced mechanisms besides that that might be important if you don't like that one? Um, there are. So um, I have some ideas regarding destabilization of the ISO. So, anyways, let me just first say I don't think that 
you know, maybe my wording here may is, is probably you know a little bit misleading. Um, if you look from one reanalysis data product to the other, um, you get different impressions on these budget terms that I showed you. So I don't want to put too much stake in one reanalysis, um, but there are other ways that um, sea surface temperature feedbacks can affect the ISO. So for example, um, one thing that sea surface temperature feedbacks can do is enhance surface fluxes locally, especially near the onset of ISO convection. And so you could put that in terms of the framework of a budget like I showed you um, to show that it's an important destabilization mechanism. So um, yeah, so I, I think maybe my wording here is a little bit misleading. I think um, I feel a little bit more strongly about the second point than it might, might lead on here. Uh, it's short, we'll go to Devashis in the back. I even had a mic, <laughs> but Devashis can talk. Deepak. Uh, Eric, I have a question about the uh, moisture gradients. So in the Bay of Bengal, uh, you can understand there's high moisture towards the north because of the Himalayas. In the case of MJO, uh, what is the moisture gradient that might keep it going eastwards? So it, in the uh, winter time, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so in the uh, winter time, there's more of a sort of a symmetric distribution of uh, um, moisture about the equator so there's a reasonably strong fall off for example in the northern hemisphere between the equator and 20 degrees north is a consistent gradient and um mjo to the east is basically through anomalous meridional advection caused by the rossby gyres associated with the MJO. So you have Rossby gyres of one sign to the east of convection and Rossby gyres of another sign to the west of convection. So it's meridional advection across that um, north-south moisture gradient that does it, the MJO. In the interest of time, we'll, I invite Simon up for his next talk. I'm told that both Simon and Eric will be available at the beer sessions as well. There will be a tutorial.